So, uh, what I want to talk to you, the, I, this, not too long ago, um, God spoke to me incredibly through this story. And that is why I want to share with you today. And the story goes something like this. You know, you go back to, to understand the concept of where this whole dialogue is happening between Jesus and his father. Um, you know, you have to go back to the verse 14. And it goes, you know, let me read the story first and then I'll go line by line and, you know, bring out, uh, you know, uh, the, the meanings and what's going on. So, uh, so verse 14, and when he came to the disciples, he saw a great multitude around them and the scribes disputing with them. Immediately when they saw him, all the people were greatly amazed and running to him, greeted him and asked the scribes. And he asked the scribes, what are you discussing with them? Then one of the crowd answered and said, teacher, I brought you my son whom, who has a mute spirit. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth and become rigid. So I spoke to you disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. He answered him and said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. Then they brought him to him and he saw him. Immediately the spirit convulsed him and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. So he asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And often he has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. As you're seeing, this is a scenario wherein a father who has a child who is troubled by the unclean spirit. And he comes to the disciples and says, hey, help me here. And for some reason, the disciples could not cast out this demon. So to give you a little context, the disciples in Matthew chapter 10, verse 1, right? This is what it says. And when he had called his 12 disciples to him, that is Jesus, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. disease. So Jesus... You know, you know, in this world, when he is doing his ministries, he called his disciples. They're learning from him. He have, they have seen what Jesus could do as a son of God. And then they call, you know, then he gave them the power to do what Jesus was doing. And then he sent them out two by two, right? These are the people who received from God, who has the authority to do things, who have done these things. Please understand. The key is they have already done casting out demons, healing the sick. And here an instance wherein they could not do it. Now this story is in all three gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, you know, brings out the story. And all three of them mentions the key part, which is Jesus' answer. And before we get to it, I really try to dig up a little bit and try to understand why they lacked that faith to cast out demons. So th this is, you know, right after the transfiguration on the mount, right? Jesus was transfigured, right? And then this is, he's coming down, right? And this, he's seeing this whole uh, commotion of what's happening. So if you go past, you can see how Jesus is talking about his death and resurrection. 
And my best guess is, you know, it's not specified by any of the gospel writers, but my best guess is, you know, they had the power. They're doing everything. And the next thing is Jesus is talking about his death and his resurrection. And they have no idea how this whole resurrection works. They've never heard the story before. They have never seen it. They, the Jewish understanding of resurrection is very different. So maybe, maybe, one of the biblical scholars' hypothesis is maybe they don't know. They have doubts now, right? The Messiah who is supposed to fix all their problems is all of a sudden talking about, okay, my time is up, you know, I'm, I'm going to go, I'm going to die. Maybe that's why they are starting to have that doubt creep into their life. And then they are not able to do in spite of having directly received the authority to do the miracles directly from Jesus, right? And when this whole thing is happening, the scribes are present there. And I'm guessing, you know how the history goes with the religious leaders in Jesus, right? And I'm pretty sure they might have sparked another conversation. Hey, you sure this is real? You sure that Jesus, the so-called rabbi of yours, is genuine? Do you think he is, he is who says he is? Now they are adding to their doubts, right? So this whole commotion is happening. And that is when Jesus walks out to them. And he says, what are you discussing with them? And one of, the, you know, one of the crowd answered and said, Teacher, I bought you my son who has a mute spirit. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down. He forms its mouth and gnashes his teeth and become rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. Now I'm thinking from this father's perspective, all he, he his, you know, uh, I think Matthew mentions, you know, uh, that that's his only child. So this man who has his only child from a very young age, since the time they knew that is troubled by something that they could not find cure. Their whole, they, I'm pretty sure as a parent, this father might have tried everything, everything to find a cure for his son. Right? And then finally, he hears about this Jesus, his miracles, you know, feeding the 5,000, doing, you know, all these great miracles. So he comes and tries to find the disciples. I mean, it's not exactly in the Bible. I'm like trying to paint you a picture of that father's mindset, right? Just put yourself in this story, right? How would you, you know, go through this, right? His only child going through something that has no answers to, no cure, no hope. The key is no hope. And then finally he hears about Jesus and comes. And now... Whatever the tiny little of hope he had, with that he comes in and he is disappointed that the disciples of Jesus could not heal his son. And then Jesus hears him and then first he is little mad at the disciples, right? He goes, oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? Now, the fun part is all three gospel writers unanimously wrote this part. And exactly what Jesus said, oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bringing to me. He's, he's, you know, th there is a debate among the Bible scholars on like, you know, the, he, he, he's specifically talking about, you know, the, the generation of, you know, the whole generation of Jewish, uh, you know, people when you know, he comes out of Messiah, nobody believes him, right? 
uh, the faithless generation who's looking for signs and wonders. And um, then also, um, you know, specifically to the disciples who been with Jesus, seen the miracles, who had done miracles themselves, is at a point wherein they are like, uh, sorry, we couldn't do this, right? And after that comes the most interesting two dialogues that really, really caught my attention. Jesus said, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. From the early on, the ministry of Jesus It's not the ability of Jesus to heal someone or it's not the ability whether Jesus can do something. It always depends on the faith of the person who is coming to him. Because this is the common theme in New Testament. He kept asking, do you believe? Do you believe? Do you believe? It's the same way he is asking the Father, If you can believe, (laughs) Jesus is demanding this father's faith. Can you believe? Do you believe in me that I can do this? And the best honest answer that I could see in the Bible is, this is the most amazing thing that blew my mind is like, I believe, help my unbelief. The person's, the contradicting statement that I took me a while to understand. Wait a second. Wait, wait, wait. You believe or you don't believe? You just said, I believe. The very next thing is, help my unbelief. What does that even mean? Help my unbelief. Jesus demanded his faith. And the answer he got is like, I'm trying. I am trying to believe. All my life, I was hopeless. I tried everything I could do. Finally, I hear about this Jesus who have healed, who have fed thousands, who have done these great miracles. I am hoping, but I come, I'm disappointed. You know, after the disciples incident, now I don't know what to do. All I have here is I'm trying to believe. Maybe you can help me believe. Maybe you can help me. Give me a little bit of your faith. Because I don't have, you know, if you go back to the root language, it says, uh, the, you know, it, it Kinds of translated into, my faith is not perfect, right? It's mixed with doubt. It's mixed with, you know, other distractions in there. So he is trying his best to say, Lord, I believe. But there is a but in there, but I don't know. I have so much doubt. I have questions. I am not perfect enough. My faith is not perfect enough. So here I am. And Jesus, pleased with the answer, he cast out the demon and heals that son. Now, why I'm, I, I, I picked out this story is not too long ago, a couple of weeks ago, I made this prayer. I made this prayer from the, the desperation of my heart. I said, God, I believe, help My unbelief. You could be a Christian for all your life. You could be ministry leaders. You could be board members. You could be the guy who led thousands of people to Christ. You could be anything. But there will be instances in your life you might have to pray that prayer. But I encourage you, keep it honest and pray that prayer. There's no one judging you. God is not here to judge you and say, oh, what happened? What happened to your faith? There will be instances in your life that you will have to make that honest in prayer and say, I believe, help my unbelief. 
All my life I've been a Christian, son of a pastor. You all know this, right? I've gone through, <clears throat> I've seen God's faithfulness repeatedly again and again. I've seen miracles happen again and again. I've seen people, you know, demons cast out right in front of me. I have seen a lot. And after all this, I am on my knees and I'm praying, God, I believe, help my unbelief. And this goes back, I don't know what your, your struggles are in life, but let me tell you a secret. Your problem is the biggest problem on the earth. We all look our problems as the biggest challenge. You don't have a job, that's your biggest struggle. Your marriage is falling about, that's your biggest challenge. You're worried about your children. You're worried about your sickness. You're worried about everything. We try to put our problems in front of us that we fail to see who God is. And then this doubt starts creeping in. You're the person who preached on faith. You're the person who shares your faith. And here you are. Don't know what to do because your problems is the biggest problem. So most of you know this. I lost my job a year ago. This October uh, was one year anniversary of my job loss. Um, I wasn't worried. I wasn't worried a bit. I knew God is in control. God will take care of it. God got this, right? And then months go by. Uh, the, one of the side businesses I started, it started booming. It was started growing. It started going crazy to a point we had 11,000 square feet warehouse, and it was just going great. So when that income stopped, I was paying my bills. You know, I was having another source of income. Everything is great. I'm praising God. I'm glorifying. I'm testifying, right? And then one day, uh, middle of this thing, you know, I lost my client. And everything stops. Bill starts piling up. And I'm like, you know what? God will provide. But nothing is happening. I said, God will give me a job maybe. Or God will give me a client. God can do anything he wants, right? Like months goes by, months goes by. Letters starts coming in from the mortgage company. And, you know, it starts piling up. And then... You get to a point, God, what are you doing? The doubt starts creeping in. And the same person who, like, not too long ago stood up and preached about, you know, if you want to see, you know, if you want the building blocks of your faith, look into your past. The same guy is struggling now. And then got to a point one day, I'm like, I don't know, God. And I'm making this honest prayer. God, I believe. Help my unbelief. You know, my mom, she's been struggling with some sort of sickness for the last 35, no, 36 to 37 years now. And that we prayed. We took her to doctors, um, multiple doctors in India, doctors here in the U.S., Nobody can find what the problem is. Nobody knows everything is normal. All tests comes out normal. But she has been suffering for 35 years. We sometimes ask God, like, why? Right? Sometimes we don't understand what we go through. But we need to know that our God is bigger. And that was my problem. I put my bills, I put my joblessness, I put my immediate problem, and it was the greatest problem for me. I wasn't that guy who would go up and like, oh, somebody in our church is suffering, let me go pray over them. I'm not very proud of this, but I have to say this to encourage the church. I was not that guy who was going and, 
you know, trying to bless others in my weakness because my problem was the biggest problem. And then when I made that prayer, things started to change. I said, God, I believe, help my unbelief. When I prayed that day, the first thing that came to my mind is like, same thing I'm just telling you. I put my problems ahead of the amazing God, the God who we cannot comprehend, the God's love that cannot be described, the guy who created the universe. The best part is I'm, I said, you know what? My God is bigger than anything else. And my worship to him have declined because I put my problems first. Excuse me, I think I'm like, I need to get my water. Sorry, I left it in your office. I'm sorry. Let me get. Let's just hope he comes back. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that because I think my voice is not helping though. So, I am putting my problems first. The biggest revelation I had is that day was, if... God wants to give me a job, he can give it to me. If God wants to give my mom his healing, it takes one second, not even a second, just snap of a finger, he can give it. He can solve all your problems. Every single one of your problems can be solved. He is a God who you don't, sometimes we, we don't give we don't stop and think who our God is. So that's when, you know, worshiping the God and the song comes on, indescribable. And the word goes like this. Who tells where the lightning bolt should go? Understand, when there is a lightning striking in the sky, God is the one who is directing it, which direction it should go. Such an amazing and awesome God who is in control of the smallest thing that we don't even bother to think. Such an amazing God we have. And we put our problems in front of him. So I said, you know what? Forget about me being jobless. Forget about my financial troubles. Forget about everything else. I'm going to worship God. And I started worshiping God, listening to these songs and being encouraged by it, understanding who he is. Then next song comes in, right? Blessed be the name. Blessed be the name in the land of the suffering. Like, you know, there's pain in the offering. You give and you take away. God gave me the business. He took it away. Who am I to question it? It was, wasn't it his before? Wasn't it his after? Everything that you have, it's from God. Why are you upset when God takes it back? Nothing ever belonged to you. It is only by his grace you have what you have. And what we do is we put our problems, our silly things in front of an awesome and a great God. our sicknesses, our whatever you can think of. Again, I'm telling you, if God wanted to change your situation, one snap of a finger, it's solved. So I started worshiping God. I started focusing on him. I said, you know what? I'm not going to worry about this anymore. I don't know if I'm going into foreclosure. Listen, I, I was very reluctant to share this, you know, but... But I think I have to share this to, you know, for the encouragement of church. So after all this, um, one of our sisters in Christ, um, you know, whom we fellowship with in Long Island, uh, she moved to Texas. She calls me and like, bro, what's going on? And I'm like, yay, being jobless. What's up with you? Oh, me too. <laughs> and she had an accident. And uh, for six months, she's on unpaid leave because she can't work. You know, she has our limitations. And we are talking, and she is going through something worse than me. Now, let me give you a tip. Whenever you think you have a problem and your problem is the biggest problem, 
Try comparing it with other people's problems. Right? Because this whole thing is happening. I have a, 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 a chart or whatever you want to call it. It says pray for the persecuted on my wall in my office. And it gives you all the countries uh, where the gospel is restricted or hostile. Um, so, and I pray for them, you know, on a regular basis, uh, thinking that they are brothers and sisters in Christ uh, who's been, whose husband has been killed, children has been slaughtered because they believe in Christ, right? And we have perfect uh, freedom to worship. So we, you know, but, so I take some time to pray for them. And I'm looking at them and I'm like, my problem is I don't have a job, but I have a house. I have amazing four kids. I have a car. I have food on my table. I have every comfort that I can think of. I've heat in my house, right? Wherein somebody somewhere especially in Sudan right now, right? Being killed because they are not willing to deny Jesus as their Lord and praise and Savior, Jesus Christ, right? Like, you know, they're like, sorry, whatever you want to do, like, and they've been persecuted so bad and I'm complaining about me not having a job and I stop worshiping God because I don't have a job, right? So, you know, this all changed, and I'm having this conversation with her, and she's going through really tough times, too, with a lot of other things. We, you know, I, you know, she prayed for me. I prayed for her. We are encouraging each other from the word, and we shared what God was speaking to each other and all this. And then the next day, she calls me and is like, hey, I want to bless you. And... Um, you know, she asked me some questions, and she's like, okay. Um, she tried to sell it. No, nope, it didn't work. So she sends me a card. And uh, after delayed two weeks, finally the post office delivers. I open it, and I start crying. I start crying. She paid three months of my mortgage. And this is a person who didn't have an income. And she paid three months of my mortgage. And I called her. And I'm like, what? What? How? And this is what she said. Listen, you would do the same if somebody else is in this situation. And if you look at the first century Christians, they sold everything they had. They brought in at the feet of apostles. They lived as a community. And they served God. And it blew my mind away. And then I started to think, it started to minister to me. I started to understand what God is doing here. I am starting to see, wait a second, there is a lot more in God's plan than just giving me a job. Again, if he wanted to give me, he would have given it me last October. But I had to go through what I had to go through so that God's name be glorified. So that as the believers, we are able to do what we are called to do. So when you're struggling, why I'm saying all this is, you will have instances in your life where the doubts will creep in. You will question everything. You don't even know if this is the same God that you decided to follow years ago. At that time, my encouragement is this. It's okay. It's okay to be in that spot. All you need to do is go to him and be as honest as possible and say, God, I don't know what you're doing, but I know for one thing that you're in control. You're in control, and whatever happens, it's for your glory. And that's all it matters. My job doesn't matter. My mom's healing doesn't matter. It's his glory. And the fun thing is, in the same story, when Matthew is trying to explain, 
he explains the, um, he, he, he also records the interaction after this whole incident, right? Uh, because, um, you know, um, so he records Matthew chapter 21, uh, verse, no, hold on. Okay, uh, Matthew chapter 17, verse uh, 19 and 20. He says, then the disciple came to J uh, Jesus privately and asked, why could we not cast it out? So Jesus said to him, because of your unbelief, for assuredly I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move and move from, there, uh, move from here to there and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. And Jesus is saying, listen, it's all because you didn't have faith. And you don't need like huge mountain like faith. All you need is this mustard seed like faith. All my life I've heard this verse. I never understood it. Very later in my life I understood what that meant. It simply means like this father who came, who's struggling to put his trust, struggling to have that faith. You come to him with the little faith that you have, the tiny bit, the unnoticeable faith, and that word of trust, and come to him and just say, God, here I am. And when you put your faith in God, as Hebrews 11, 6 says, but without faith it is impossible to please him. Why do we need faith? Because without it, it's impossible to please God. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2 says, you know, he's the author and the finisher of our faith. It all starts from Jesus and it will end in Jesus. He is the one who gives us faith. All we need to do is in our surrounding, in our situations, in, 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 in my story, I am starting this. I put aside my doubt. I came to him with my little faith and I gave him all the worship that is due unto him. He started working in miraculous way. As of today, all my bills are caught up. He used someone. In this process, there is a refinement process happening in me. I can minister to people. I can encourage people. This message came out because I went through what I went through. And she is going through, and she is experiencing God's faithfulness. She is experiencing. So there is this whole edification happening. There is this, there is trust. There is this. I can't even explain what is happening because of what what I went through. So this is my encouragement today. To have, to go to God when your faith is wavering. Because of your situations in life, pull back a step. Can you see God? Pull back another step until you can see the biggest God. And say, God, I worship you for who you are. And whatever is happening in my life, it's for your glory. And all I have is I'm struggling with doubt. I'm here with my tiny little faith. The trust, the knowing that you're in control. And understand, Bible is full of promises. He promised he, is not, he will not leave you, not forsake you. He said, ask and it shall be given to you. There's so many, so many passages that encourage us. Are we focusing on our problems or are we going to go back to the word and say, God, this is what you said and I'm going to take refuge in him, in it. And I'm going to bring you my small, tiny faith and increase my faith. Increase my faith. And just as a disclaimer, it's a dangerous prayer. When you pray, increase my faith. The last time I prayed on 2016 in one of the family retreats from our church, I genuinely, I'm not lying there. I'm genuinely prayed, like so deeply said, God, increase my faith. Next week, I lost my job. 
So be careful when you pray that prayer because God might answer you. And, but trust me, that was the best thing ever because that situation at that time, I had to go through what I had to go through to grow in my faith. It doesn't matter whether I'm pastor, son, I know all the word of God. It doesn't matter whatever it is like, you know, but there will be time where you, you need to go further in your faith. And when God gives you that opportunity, go back to his word so that you can take to him your tiny faith so he can grow it. Shall we close our eyes? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And then when I was worshiping God that day, the, the, one of the other songs that comes to, you know, in my list was, give me faith to trust what you say for your good. Your love is great. I'm broken inside. I give you my life. So sometimes when we lack faith, just go to him and pray. Make this prayer. Father God, I give this congregation into your hand, Father God. Whatever areas they're struggling or they are not able to see your hands, I pray that they will go come to you and make that honest prayer to believe, to put his trust in you and increase their faith. Our faith is not perfect, but you are perfect and you are the author and the finisher of our faith. And we come to you so that you may have, help us to see the bigger God in all our situations. Thank you for who you are, God. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, through whom we have salvation, and we thank you for everything. All glory and honor to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.